Emory 17 emergency. Emory 17, say again? When a pilot declares an emergency, that really cues an air traffic controller to know that this isn't just an abnormal situation. This is a critical situation. The ground proximity warning begins to sound. We're sinking. We're going down, guys. All right, all right. August 7th, 1997. Fine Air Cargo Flight 101 prepares to take off from Miami to the Dominican Republic. At 12.30 p.m., when Flight 101 taxis to its runway, First Officer Petrosky recites a familiar drill. Okay, standard fine air procedure. There's a problem prior to V1, which is 130 knots. The pilot in command will abort the airplane. Treat anything after V1 as an in-flight emergency. Sounds good. At 12.34, the tower makes contact. Fine Air 101, fly heading 270, cleared for takeoff. Clear takeoff 27 right. Fine Air 101 heavy. OK, force spooled and stable. Max power. OK, coming up on 60 knots, power set. 80. V1, rotate. The plane lifts off the runway. Okay, easy, easy. Easy, easy, easy. You're up. is alarmed by what he now sees. What's going on? Whoa! Whoa! The crew fights to get the plane under control. Too low. Gear. Too low. Too low. Terrain. Plane's three-man crew and security guard are confirmed dead. Before the crash, XL Airways Flight 888, the captain tries to fly out of trouble. He increases power while pushing his side stick forward to bring the nose down. It's a textbook maneuver to prevent stalling, but it doesn't work. The plane continues to pitch up until it loses lift and falls from the sky. Investigators need to know why. The flight plan calls for flying the plane through a series of 35 in-flight tests that make up what's known as an acceptance flight. OK, get your power at idle. A computer simulation helps investigators analyze Flight 888's final flight check. OK, here we go. Captain Keppel deliberately slows his plane down for the test, but the computer lets the speed drop too far below the minimum needed to keep the plane in flight. Pose Investigators it. notice a warning on the cockpit flight display moments before the crash. There. What is that? They learn that the warning is supposed to alert the pilots the flight computer is no longer helping to fly the plane. It is switched to full manual mode. The warning comes on when the plane's computer gets conflicting information. The frozen sensors are telling the computer the plane is flying level, while other onboard sensors are relaying its extreme nose-up attitude. One must be wrong. The plane gave the pilot control right here. It seems the crew of Flight 888 either didn't see or didn't understand the warning being sent by the computer. Stick forward. 
The pilot uses his side stick to try to lower the nose. Stick forward. In manual mode, that's just not enough. The crew also needs to adjust the trim wheel for a more dramatic change of pitch. But they never do. Investigators need to know why such an experienced crew Turn failed right, to act about, quickly right when their plane was in danger. They suspect one reason may be the unusual nature of this flight, an acceptance flight designed to test the plane's limits. OK, that's good. During the turn, let's roll to 33, then to 45. OK. Every time they test the plane. Hands off now. The automation fixes the problem. Yep, yes, voila, it's all good. Even when they hear alarms, they don't worry. We need to overspeed. You just want to hear the overspeed warning? They're expecting the plane to correct the problem. There it is. You can cancel the warning if you like. They trusted their plane too much. Stick forward. Flaps up. Flaps up! With their plane in a catastrophic stall, the seven men aboard Flight 888 were doomed. Oh, God! Oh, God! Damn it! The official accident report highlights several contributing factors, including the decision to perform flight checks at low altitude. Yeah, we need to go slow with recovery. The report also calls for clearer rules governing acceptance flights and more training for stall recovery. It's Easter Monday, 1994, at Amsterdam Schiphol Airport. Set, Torque. My controls. KLM City Opera Flight 433 is on its way from Amsterdam to Cardiff, Wales. Look out ahead of us. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. Captain Levard spots thunderclouds ahead. He wants to get above them. That's control for flight level 200. Amsterdam KLM 433. Go ahead, 433. Is flight level 200 available? Climb to 200, you are re-cleared flight level 200. Amsterdam air traffic control okays the climb to 20,000 feet. Okay, uh, we're not climbing anymore. Approaching 17,000 feet, Captain Levard notices a problem with his plane's performance. No. It's not climbing as quickly as it should be. You need to return to Amsterdam, make a pan call, request to maintain flight level 160. Tell them we have a technical issue. Amsterdam KLM 433, pan, 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 pan. We have an engine problem, and we'd like to maintain 160 for return to Schiphol. That's copy, sir. You may turn right, heading to Schiphol. The pan call sends the controller into action. We have a pan from KLM 433, now returning to Schiphol. At the airport, emergency vehicles race to positions near the runway. KLM 433 is just 500 feet above the ground. Watch your speed. The plane has slowed to a dangerously low speed. I'm on it. A sudden bank to the right takes the passengers by surprise. The captain struggles to keep the plane level. Going around, set torque, flap seven, gear up. Then he tries to abort the landing attempt. Flight 433 is now beyond recovery. Steer! 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 Garrett! 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 Oh, 
Crash, crash, crash. Runway 06, emergency runway 06. KLM City Hopper 433 has crashed in full view of Amsterdam Schiphol Airport Control Tower. Bagram Airfield in northeastern Afghanistan. It's a hive of activity. Bagram, ground, ISAF. 9-5, Alpha Quebec, ready to taxi. The crew of National Airlines Flight 102 is on the last leg of a grueling shift. The flight plan has taken it from Chateau, France, to Camp Bastion, Afghanistan, where the crew loaded up to 207,000 pounds of cargo. They were supposed to take it straight to Dubai, but were rerouted via Bagram. Finally, at 3.25 p.m., they're cleared for takeoff. 9-5 Alpha Quebec, runway three, full length. Runway three is verified. Prepare for departure. The first officer is at the controls for this final leg. They're scheduled to arrive in Dubai in two and a half hours. At that same moment, military journalist Stephen Hartoff is on the base's perimeter road returning from a day's work taking photographs for a magazine. We decided we were going to go get something to eat, and I saw off to the left of the truck a white and purple 747. And I remember thinking, this is a beautiful airplane, because it looked brand new. V1, rotate. Gear up. Gear up. He pulled away from us and started to rotate. And in this case, there was something immediately not right. The climb is unusually steep. What's going on with that aircraft? It was almost stuttering in the air. K keep on that. Get the nose down! I'm trying! The plane is suddenly uncontrollable. The nose won't drop. My airplane! In a matter of seconds, the crew is in emergency mode. If they can't get the nose down fast, the plane will stall. Anking. 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 For a moment, the plane hangs in the air suspended. And then the aircraft seemed to sort of careen in our direction. Now you're looking at a big 747 coming at you. Stop the car. And then it completely foundered and stalled. And uh, I remember thinking, he's lost all his engines. Don't sink. Don't sink. And in a very slow motion, it just went straight down and pancaked into the ground. The explosion was enormous. Did Flight 708 stall in midair because it was too heavy? During our visit to Panama, we observed that West Caribbean didn't have very rigorous control over the checking of passengers' luggage and their weight. De los pasajeros. If a plane is too heavy, it may not be able to fly at higher altitudes where the air is less dense. Pilots need to make these calculations carefully. Un piloto sabe a qué altitud puede volar. The pilot knows at what altitude he can fly by studying the aircraft's performance tables and inputting the plane's weight and the temperature. What investigators don't know is whether Captain Ospina did the math correctly. Stand by. They now try to calculate whether Flight 708 was too heavy to avoid stalling at 33,000 feet. So we went back and looked at the number of, of, of passengers on board, the number of crew on board, and the weight of the aircraft itself, along with the baggage. They already tested the plane at its reported weight of 148,000 pounds. All right, let's add a few thousand pounds. We got heavier luggage, misweighed cargo, 
Uh, let's try 155,000 pounds. Investigators now make the calculations for a plane that's grossly overweight. They're in for a surprise. And even with a heavier aircraft at takeoff, the aircraft could maintain level flight at 330. It's a setback for the investigation. We're missing something. Let's go back to the beginning. After much research, investigators still can't figure out what caused the plane to stall. Thanks. The answer has to do with how a plane distributes power. When it's turned on, the anti-icing system draws energy from the engines, reducing power for thrust. This decrease in thrust can affect the performance of the airplane depending on the weight and the altitude. So the performance study showed that the airplane was perfectly safe to fly at 33,000 feet with the anti-ice off. Anti-ice on, please. However, it could only fly as high as 31,900 feet with the anti-ice on. It was the anti-icing. Robbed them of the power they needed. They shouldn't have gone higher than 31.9. La conclusión a que llega el equipo de investigación. We concluded that the aircraft was flown too high for its weight and the weather conditions it faced. The investigators learned that neither pilot had ever landed a DC-8 at Guantanamo. They wonder if the captain knew that runway 10 was a more challenging approach than runway 28. They studied the airline's procedures. They had to watch a video. That's it. Because of the difficulty landing at Guantanamo, military pilots require special training to land on runway 10. But the cargo airline only required its civilian pilots to watch a short video. Exercise extreme caution when landing on runway 10. Records show the captain and first officer had both watched the training video within the past year. Align your base leg just to the right of the strobe beacon. This beacon identifies the U.S.-Cuban boundary beginning at the shoreline. To avoid Cuban airspace on the left, the plane must make a tight right turn. Where's the strobe? Right over there. It, where? Right over there. It, where? The captain can't locate the strobe light that marks the Cuban border. You know, we're not getting airspeed back there. The flight engineer notices that the plane is still flying more than 10 knots too slow. Where's the strobe? Right down there. I, I still don't see it. Instead of increasing his airspeed, the captain keeps trying to find the strobe light. Flight engineer Richmond sees the DC-8 isn't properly positioned for the landing. Do you think you're going to make this? Yeah. If I can catch the strobe light. First Officer Curran is also concerned. But Captain Chapo isn't taking the hint. The DC-8 begins its critical final turn. The team needs to know why the crew didn't abandon an approach that was clearly going wrong. Air Asia Flight 8501 cruises high above the Java Sea north of Indonesia. The pilot in command is 53-year-old Captain Irianto. He's highly experienced with more than 20,000 hours in the air. His first officer is French national Rémy Emmanuel Plaisel. He is 46 with about 2,000 flight hours, much of it on the Airbus. 22 minutes into the flight, the pilots notice bad weather ahead on their radar. The captain decides to increase altitude to go above the storm clouds in their path. I'm going to radio for a higher cruise, get around that weather. Good idea. 
But before the captain can contact air traffic control, he gets a fault warning from the flight computer. ECAM actions. The plane's sophisticated computers give the pilot step-by-step -step instructions on how to fix the issue. The pilots now notice that the plane is rolling sharply left. Level. OK, level. Something is going terribly wrong with flight 8501. The first officer is struggling. Level. But soon, the plane is rolling again. Level. I'm, I'm trying. The pilots can't seem to regain control. <laughs> it's not responding. Pull down. <laughs> It's not correcting. The plane seems to have taken on a life of its own. It climbs higher and higher as the pilots fight to level off. Then, inexplicably, the plane starts to drop. Altitude. I see it. Flight 8501 is plummeting from the sky, speeding toward the ocean below. It seems the pilots can do nothing to save their plane. Pull! It's not correcting. What's going on? Max power. Slowly! <laughs> 43 minutes into what should have been a normal two-hour flight. Air Asia Flight 8501 disappears from radar. Pull! I'm trying! Pull! It's not correcting! Ah. Of the 162 passengers and crew, there are no survivors. After being delayed for more than an hour, Span Air Flight 5022 is finally getting back underway. There are 166 passengers on board many of them looking to escape the stifling heat of Madrid in August. Everyone was full of anticipation. Everyone wanted to be on their way. Anna Stefanides has come to Spain from Sweden. She is on her way to the Canary Islands to meet some friends. Most of Europe has holidays, different summer holidays in August. I was going to Gran Canaria to meet my girlfriends. We were going to have one week's holidays, four leaves. Spanair 5022, Joe Nexon 9 on runway 36 left. OK, here we go. At 2.23, the MD-82 aircraft starts speeding down the runway. One hundred. The captain watches their speed. They can't lift off until they reach 157 knots. Takeoff speed. V1. Rotate. warns the pilots something is going wrong. Engine failure? Oh, the first officer increases power, but he's losing control of the plane. How the hell do you turn off that warning? The plane is less than 40 feet from the ground. I managed to think, this is my last trip. I've had a good life. I thought, now I die. Fly the plane. Fly it! Just seconds after takeoff, 
Flight 5022 slams into a riverbank beside the runway. The plane with 172 people on board is now shattered wreckage spread over half a mile. Captain Kevin Stables is preparing to pilot Emory Worldwide Flight 17. His first officer is George Land. They're hauling freight across the country aboard a 30-year-old DC-8 cargo plane. Uh, hi there. Is that the load plan? Just before they're finished up and loading the last uh, couple of containers, they would give us a list of all the freight containers and how much it weighed and what position on the airplane it was. There you go, boss. Then we'd take that information and we would calculate the weight and balance on the airplane and make sure that it was all correct. Airspeed's alive. Alive here. 80 knots. 80 knots. Elevator checks. Just another routine takeoff. V1. Rotate. But as the nose wheel leaves the ground, the DC-8 pitches upward much more steeply than it should. Watch the tail. They recognize that they have an issue during the course of the airplane actually starting to rotate as it lifts off the runway. V2, positive rate. The sudden takeoff is quickly followed by an uncommanded left bank. I got it. You got it? Yeah. This is anything but routine. We're going back. What the hell? The center of gravity is way out of limits. They need to return to the airport as quickly as possible. Emory 17, emergency. Emory 17, say again? When a pilot declares an emergency, that really cues an air traffic controller to know that this isn't just an abnormal situation. This is a critical situation. The ground proximity warning begins to sound. We're sinking. We're going down, guys. All right, all right. OK, we're going back up. The DC-8 starts climbing again. Roll out, roll out! But the pilots are still struggling for control. Ugh. Emory 17, extreme balance problem. Emory 17, roger. The airplane started to go into these big perturbations, dive and then climb, dive and then climb. Ugh. They push their control columns all the way forward in a desperate effort to level the plane. Power. More? Yeah. Captain Stables and his crew have managed to get their crippled plane to within sight of the runway. It was working very well. He made it almost all the way around to the backside of the airport. They knew if they could get back to the airport, there was going to be crash fire rescue that would have been able then to help them. They've now got less than a mile to go. They're still trying to look ahead to figure out what needs to be done next. But they know that sooner or later, they got to get on the ground. 